Uh, obviously, a very sad uh, happening this week. Matulu Shakur, former freedom fighter, fighter for black liberation, former political prisoner, passed away. And I think that it's only right that we remember his memory. And we are very, very honored to be joined by Kalanji Changa, who is a co-founder of Black Power Media for this discussion. Kalanji, thank you so much for joining us. Honored to be here. How you guys doing? Doing very well, very well. And, you know, the honor is all ours. And, you know, maybe to start here, perhaps for those who who don't know, who was Matulu Shakur? Uh, I would say that Dr. Matulu Shakur was a um, a lifelong uh, representative of uh, a new African uh, independence movement. Um, he's a brother who, for all practical purposes, started off as a young soldier, literally, at the age of 15, um, and worked his way and earned his stripes as a general in our, in our people's uh, uh, liberation movement. Uh, Dr. Shakur... Um, started off as a child advocating for his mother who was blind um and he would go um you know advocate and navigate for her throughout social services social systems so on and so forth and he learned at an age at an early age that um that he and we had to speak up for ourselves if we were to survive uh imperialism and capitalism inside of this country and abroad um he learned from he was inspired and influenced by malcolm x you know, as a youth, he went to, um, he grew up in Queens and members of the Nation of Islam took him and some other uh, other youth to go see Malcolm on occasion to hear him speak up in Harlem. And Mal he was inspired. And from there, he met his ideological father, Herman, F Herman Ferguson. Uh, Herman Ferguson uh, was a leader in the uh, uh, revolutionary uh, uh excuse me, in the uh, Republic of New Africa. And he is also a comrade of Malcolm as well. So um, Dr. Matulu actually, or young Matulu was a, uh, he used to go to a community center and Herman Ferguson was one of the, the advocates there and he took him under his wing and it was him who brought him into the Republic of New Africa uh, in 1968 when it formed. Um, from there, you know, he met his, um, his spiritual father, Saladin Shakur. He said he had three fathers, and those fathers was Herman Ferguson, Saladin Shakur, who was known as the the father or the progenitor of the um, of the Shakur clan, you know, the Shakur family. He was a brother that um, was also the father of Zaid Shakur and Lamoma Shakur. Of course, we know that Zaid Shakur was uh, assassinated, murdered on that New Jersey Turnpike with Asada Shakur shot with Asada Shakur and um, Sundiata Kohli. So uh, 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 Saladin, known as Alba, took him under his wing. From there, uh, he met his, uh, what he would call his street father. And his street father was known as Abubadika, which many of us know as Sonny Carson. Um, we may be familiar with The Education of Sonny Carson, which was an old film about his life. And for those of you who are hip hop fans, Sonny Carson was also the father of Professor X from um, from the X Clan. But these three men helped to uh, shape and mold Dr. Matulu Shakur. Uh, I had a convo with Baba Herman Ferguson um, before he transitioned. And one of the things he told me was that when there was this uh, New Bethel incident, the uh, church owned by C.L. Franklin in uh, Detroit. Matulu Shakur was doing security, 16, 17 year old. And when the police vamped on that church and shot through the church, Matulu Shakur threw uh, Baba Herman Ferguson and his wife Ialu on the floor and laid on top of them to protect them from the bullets. This is the type of young man he was. Of course, we knew that he grew and became a acupuncturist and eventually uh, through the state's uh, you know, tactics and antics, I uh, became a political prisoner and, you know, I'll stop there and we can, you know. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, it's very important what you just mentioned. Uh, well, all of everything you just mentioned was so important. Like so much activism took place. And of course he was targeted for those reasons. Uh, and then ends up spending several decades in prison as a political prisoner with of course the state accusing him of all kinds of crimes. Um, but and 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 we can talk more about that as well. But obviously he was in ill health, and there were several opportunities to release him earlier. 
and it wasn't done until it was deemed that like basically he was going to die. So I'm just curious, can you talk a little bit about that experience of like trying to get this man who was in ill health out of prison earlier? And do you think that uh, ultimately like all like the ultimately him dying was a result of being in the U.S. prison system? which of course doesn't let necessarily lead to the best, best health outcomes. Of, of course. Um, you know, I believe he was denied parole about 10 times, if I'm not mistaken. <clears throat> Someone who was a, a model, quote unquote, prisoner, if there is such a thing. Um, I know that when I, when I first, um, I'd been in contact with him through letters uh, from the 90s. But I remember the first time I ever spoke to him, I was on the radio here in Atlanta, um, WRFG maybe in 2004 when I first moved down and um, our sister um, uh, and Jerry Algani, who's an ancestor now, she was going to be interviewing me and Dr. Matula Shakur called in from the Atlanta Federal Penitentiary. Mm. And the one thing he said was, he said, you know, we were basically arrested and doing time because of the work that like Kalanji and the FTP movement our organization was doing on the streets. And I was floored because I had no idea that he knew he that he had his finger on the pulse of the streets like that. Fast forwarding, you know, um, there they ended up being a compassionate release after you know much fighting from you know his legal team, family, and his organization. Um, and he was released back in December, I believe it was December sixteenth or eighteenth, um, December twentieth, I believe. And um, you know he lived for you know the past eight months or so. And, um, you know, so it was, you know, he was diagnosed with um, with cancer, like so many of the other freedom fighters. But to answer your question, indeed, um, you know, he we consider this a murder by the state. Because so many him and so many other political prisoners, you have folks like Michelle McGee, who has served 67 years in prison. Um, you have folks like Mumia, who's been in for over 40 years. You have Aranza Bowers, who actually uh, uh was supposed to maxed out maybe like 18, 19 years ago. Mm -hmm. So we know that prison is, is, is a death sentence. You know, we know that prison is a, a, you know, uh, prison, prison anywhere, but particularly here in the United States is a, um, you know, is a form of torture and we can only imagine. And of course, I don't think any of us on the screen have, has done any type of significant uh, jail time, but imagine you couldn't even come out your house during COVID and the the pain and and the the mental anguish that it caused you know everyday people and here it is you have folks locked up 23 and a half hours a day um i don't think it's coincidental that many of our freedom fighters have um you know been diagnosed with cancer different forms of cancer and um you know many have died so i think that it's something that is bigger than just you know they got sick and died you know or it's just some type of regular illness mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You already alluded to the role of Dr. Shakur as an acupuncture, but I was hoping you, uh, acupuncturist, I was hoping you could talk more about that and the pioneering uh, work that he was spearheading at Lincoln Detox, at Lincoln Hospital uh, in the 1970s. Right. So um, to my understanding, uh, in 1970, um, he became a, uh, um, what do you call it, a political education uh, instructor at the uh, Lincoln De Detox, um, uh, I'm sorry, Le Lincoln Detox uh, Acupuncture Center or Addiction Treatment Center. And, um, you know, they understood him and members of, you know, a number of different political organizations, including the Young Lords and the Black Panthers, so on and so forth. They understood that, quote unquote, drug addiction was a political consequence. They understood that it was due to politics. So they knew that it was an act of war. So as a, even as a youngster, they began to teach and politicize um, not only the, the victims, but, um, you know, uh, potential users and, and, and peddlers, so on and so forth. So um, and they also knew that, you know, methadone was not a solution when it came to uh, heroin addiction. You know, it was another form of addiction. It was something that the U.S. could make money off of legally. So, um, you know, he began to teach and uh, ultimately uh, he became a student of acup acupuncture, uh, learning from other uh, folks. And eventually in 1976, he was uh, uh, licensed and certified as a practice 
practicing uh, acupuncturist in the state of California. Uh, from there, he remained a program's assistant director and, um, you know, from like 78 to, I believe, 1982, right during the time that uh, he was accused of that particular uh, expropriation. And I mean, of all of the activism he was involved in, you know, that I, I guess when you put it all together, like what comes out is what's the thing? that got him targeted. Cause obviously like there's, and was that it? Like, was that, it was kind of coming up with alternatives during a time when we know that the state was perfectly fine with like flooding uh, certain communities with, with drugs. <laughs> um, there was that among many other things, like what was it that got this guy targeted uh, for this kind of like political campaign to put him behind bars? I mean, of course he was accused of, um, of a, uh, uh, Brinks truck, uh, quote unquote, robbery right. for him and, and, and several others, you know, um, and, and I just want to point out because I think that oftentimes folks are like, you know, um, what, what, what was the crime? The crime is being political. The crime is waking people up. You two uh, have been doing great work. I've been following you for quite a while. And, um, you know, the, the work you're doing the work that we're doing over at Black Power Media can qualify us as a political prisoner. We are potential terrorists just by spreading truth and information and speaking truth to power. And uh, Matuba Shakur was no exception. The brothers that I named earlier that we talked about was uh, his 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 quote unquote fathers. You know, two of those brothers were um, associates of of Malcolm X. You know what I mean? He was surrounded by nothing but freedom fighters, um, you know, in, 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 in a purest form, you know, he had political education. He was clear about who he was from a young age. And he understood that the importance of us building a united front, you know, he didn't just, uh, one of, one of the things I was talking to one of the OGs a few days ago, when we say OGs, we're not talking about original gangsters. We're talking about original gorillas, mm. right? So I was speaking to one of them a few days ago. And one of the things he said that, uh, you know, that, the Black Panther Party and the RNA in New York had shared space. And that one of the former uh, or veteran Panthers, Kamal Siddiqui, talked about how he was politicized by Dr. Matula Shakur. A lot of folks thought he was a member of the Black Panther Party, but he wasn't. However, they were intelli they was intelligent enough to learn from each other. You know what I'm saying? So the, the importance of building united fronts, the importance of groups like the Young Lords and the Black Panthers, so on and so forth. That's what Dr. Matulu Shakur stood for. So when we're talking about bringing all of these different forces together, um, being able to unite forces who are, quote unquote, uh, the lumping, you know, oftentimes we see organizers and we know plenty of organizers, but they don't go to certain areas. Right. They don't want to go to the hoods. They don't want to go to the barrios, so on and so forth, because you know, they deem, as a, deem it as a threat. And unfortunately, um, in these organizing circles, and I'm sure you all have witnessed it, um, you know, there are quote unquote gatekeepers who select who qualifies, who doesn't qualify. You know what I mean? Some folks are a little too rough, so they don't get invited to the quote unquote cookie. You know what I mean? Some folks, uh, you know, they don't have certain letters behind their name, so, you know, they're not uh, deemed intelligent. You know what I'm saying? But the, the reality is Dr. Matulu Shakur, he wasn't a, a doctor like Dr. Dre. You know what I'm saying? It wasn't just a, a slick title. This is something that he earned, but he still had his finger on the post of the streets. He still had a, a stepson like a Tupac Shakur, which Dr. Matulu Shakur was intelligent and savvy enough to utilize and what, what, um, adopt what, uh, UEP Newton said in regards to, um, uh, Taking the, um, taking the, uh, excuse me, taking your bourgeois skills and making them work in the interest of the people. He was able to seize the time. He was able to, uh, he understood power. You know, one of the things that I learned from him as well, just his organizing skills behind the wall. So even in Atlanta Federal Penitentiary and later in, in Coleman uh, Federal Penitentiary in Florida, you know, he had the quote unquote inmates, the captives, in check. You know, there was no beefing. There was, I think they said uh, there was a point where there might have been two fights a year or something like that between quote unquote street organizations. Mm. You know, so they respected him, not because of him being, 
you know, the father of Tupac, but his political work and his ability to reach the masses. It is a gift when you can reach folks on all sides of the spectrum. I think that's so true. I mean, tremendously respected. I, you know, remember once, Oh, it was maybe 10, 11 years ago, uh, Gerardo Hernandez, who was one of the Cuban Five, who's now the head of the Committees for the Defense of Revolution in Cuba, he sent me a note after I wrote the book Shackled and Chained, Mass Incarceration in Capitalist America. And in the end, you know, we had biographies of political prisoners. Dr. Matulu Shakur is in there. And anyway, he sends me this note and he says, you know, thanks for the book, so on and so forth. I'm so glad that you had this profile of my friend there on page 90, whatever it was. And I said, oh, I wonder who it was. And I looked it up and it was Dr. Matulu Shakur. So to see, you know, two freedom fighters against imperialism, against this, you know, this system who had come together, both being in prison, but just the level of respect that crossed all boundaries, I think was is so huge. And, and I, I want to just mention this before I let it go, because you did mention it. I, like many others, learned about Dr. Matula Shakur from Tupac. Uh, and if you could just say a little about his relationship with Tupac and Afini Shakur and, and uh, as well, but before we close. Right. Um, and, and I can't, you know, I, I don't... Um get too involved in everyone's, uh, you know, relationships and all of that type of stuff. But based on what I know, of course, he was, you know, him and Afeni were, t- were together at one point. And um, Tupac was, um, you know, he was the the stepfather or, you know, pretty much the father of, of Tupac Shakur. And he had a whole lot of influence on him, um, you know, and I believe they co-wrote the, uh, the Code of the Thug Life and, you know, and, and, you know, like you said, you know, he he was able to take the phenomena of, of, of hip hop, that particular culture, and make it work in our best interest. Because like you and so many others, when you listen to Pac, you heard names that you hadn't heard before. You heard about Sekou Odinga. You heard about Geronimo G. Jaga. You know what I'm saying? You heard about uh, Mumia Abu Jamal. And this was this was coming from an artist that was a mainstream artist, you know. Of course, Public Enemy and Dead Prez, they did, you know, great work. But Tupac Shakur, you know, he can go from one extreme to the next. And I think that, you know, although, you know, there, there's often contradictions in regards to how people feel about how folks organize. One of the things we talked about a few days ago on on on, uh, on our platform was how even utilizing some of the verbiage from the code of the thug life, you know, it, it might not resonate with the average everyday citizen. It might not resonate with the average, quote unquote, community organizer. But it wasn't written for us. It was written for folks who were in the streets, street organizers. So the thing is, you know, my grandmother used to say a half a loaf is better than none. Mm. We expect folks to become, um, you know, uh, politicized overnight. We forget the road that it took us to get to where we are today. So um, in saying that, you know, he was definitely an excellent organizer. Um, he is someone that we will all miss. I had the opportunity to speak to him um, a few months ago. I was actually leaving a, a show with a, a speech from the rest of the development and, you know, just coming out, you know, I'm getting this late night call and I'm like, who is this calling me after midnight? And it was a comrade of mine. And he's like, hey, I got somebody that wants to talk to you. And I'm like, I don't know who you got to talk to me after midnight, but it's better be good. You know, so it was Dr. Matula Shakur. Mm. And, you know, I, I was fanning because to me, let the record reflect, the only people that I'm a fan of is my comrades. You know what I'm saying? I'm, I'm a fan of those who fight for our liberation, those who I've met and those who I haven't met. You understand what I'm saying? Those who are brave enough, who are bold enough, whether there's a check or not, whether there's a grant, any type of funding, any uh, radio or TV play, whatever that case is, those who are serious about our liberation, I am a huge fan. And I'm a fan of you guys. So I appreciate the work that you're doing over here at Breakthrough News. And um, I definitely appreciate you all inviting me on. Well, we really appreciate you joining us, Kalanji. Black Power Media, of which you are a co-founder, we are also a fan. Couldn't recommend more highly. I hope people don't only follow but support financially. But I know you have a lot going on, brother. So thank you for giving us some of your precious time here on the Freedom Side. Appreciate you. Thank you so much. You all be safe.